Aviva when, did we meet in this room? Yes. We met in this room about a year ago. And we were here with Alejandra and we sat in a circle and uh, we talked about a lot of things. Yeah. And one of them was this idea of bringing a cacophony of trans voices into the armory. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, here we are at the culminating moment, uh, the world is memory uh, for uh, Corpus Delecti. Um, this is uh, a real, um, people could get their seats. Um, why don't you say something about what you were thinking about and putting together this last uh, panel and the day as a whole? Wow. Um, it's been a really, I'm not an event coordinator. or. <laughs> or That's not true. <laughs> you are now. No, this happened. Um, yeah, it just, it's interesting to reflect on living a life in which you've encountered so many people. And so in thinking about this invitation through Tavia with the New York Trans Oral History Project, I have just been, yeah, in the homes of and interviewing so many people over the last five years. And um, it was really easy to draw from my community. I was just like, oh yeah, like of course I want this person to perform, I want this person to speak, I want, it's just like I didn't realize that I just contain so many voices all the time and also collect them for the archive. Like I'm just, I'm like obsessive um, in my need to sort of get things, yeah, preserve things. Um, I think um, I had written some sort of intro that I didn't give, but it was around grief work and I definitely feel like, yeah, part of my grief work is preservation. It's just like wanting to hold on to something that's like very ephemeral, which is our like more, you know, just like our, like our legacies, but it's also just like the most important thing to like learn from. So yeah, that was part of this um, that like brought me into the space of wanting to see how to collage all the people that are between us. And it's been beautiful. And I'm really happy to bring in Dorian and Ricky. Yes. And I'll just, just, I'll just um, talk about Ricky for a second. Um, Ricky Sally Zoker is a multimedia artist and composer who makes performances and installations using writing, technology, and sound. Their films have been premiered at MoMA, PS1, um, Columbia University, Tate Modern, and the Abrams Art Center. Their work has been featured in magazines like Nylon, Pitchfork, and The Wire. Their music project, Yada, is characterized by textural electronic sounds, loop vocals, and rooted in improvisation, humor, and surprise. They have a playful, intuitive approach to sound and performance. Over the years, they have shared the stage with the artists like Beverly Glenn Copeland, Laraji, and the Sun Ra Orchestra, creating multimedia performances that tour nationally and internationally. They have presented installations performed at um, something in French I can't say, um, Mocha, Roulette, The Kitchen, Red Cat, MoMA, The Tate, and The Getty. I first heard uh, Dorian Wood perform at um, Human Resources in Los Angeles, um, and it's um, remarkable. I'm thinking now about your comment, Aviva, about grief work, but I was in a state of intense grief for a personal loss that was also a collective loss in that era, and her voice did something which she describes as infecting spaces and ideologies with an artistic practice that is born from a desire to challenge traditions and systems that have contributed to the marginalization of people. Dorian Wood is a multidisciplinary artist based in Los Angeles, the recipient of many awards, including the 2023 LA County Performing Arts Recovery Grant, a 2023 NALAC Fund for the Arts Grant and a Creative Capital Award um, as well as an Art Matters Foundation grant. Uh, and in 2023, she premiered Canto de Todes, which I'm very proud to say we can expect here in the Armory next year. A 12-hour chamber music composition. Uh, she has also released over a dozen recordings, most recently the album Excessiva. So please join us in welcoming... Ricky and Dorian. Here. Yeah. Wow, I spend a lot of time alone, so this is different. Okay. You have so many microphones. Yeah, I'll put this one here. Anybody want a microphone? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Thank you for having us both. I've, we, we spoke on Zoom by choice and got along really well, so well uh, done. <laughs> it seems like only yesterday, but it was actually more like three days ago, if I'm not mistaken, so what is time? <laughs> um, but so lovely to be here, to meet you in person, you to be in this extraordinary space. Um, it's a very wonderful feeling. As someone who's guided by feelings, it's bigger than any ludicrous wealth in this world. like every feeling possible. <laughs> That's very beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I'm going to share some videos from a show that I did before the pandemic. Um, um, it was called an episode Ricky's Room at the Shed and I, at the time, was going to take it on a Euro tour, but COVID hit. Um, it was called an episode Ricky's Room because um, it's an, epi an episode, like a psychotic episode. Um, and the... The show was based on an album a poetry album that I put out called Wahala. And Wahala means trouble. And so the, the songs came through in ways that I couldn't have planned for, and I probably wouldn't have planned for them to be the way that they came. Um, but they all came from poetry that I'd written um, about psychosis as a reaction to oppressive environments. 
Um, I think a lot about psychological schisms and um, the ways that being ripped from rootlands can have that happen and the ways that pressures on the body can have that happen. Um, yes, yeah, so I'll read to you what the description of the album was. Um, this album is about being black, being trans, and being African on foreign land. It's about the tension, splitting, mania, psychosis, and depression that work like a symphony of boppets to keep me alive. It's cyclical, it's meant to be played in bed and then at the club and then walking down the street and then back in bed. It's also about making jo jokes with yourself to hide what's meant to be kept for just you. Maya Angelou says to keep a room in your heart just for God. My room is full of rage, questions, confusion, and pain. I'm trying to get it clean and pristine, baby. I haven't read that since 2019, but yeah, so that's where I was. Um, let's see, what else about it? So the show, um, I'll, read, I'll read the description of the show. An episode Ricky's Room is a journey through music, dance, poetry, and video as told by Ricky, exploring what happens when multiple spirits want to create a home within the same vessel. What does it look like when the people created inside of you by gender, race, anger, and fear are given the space to breathe, make jokes, and act out? How do you reconstruct, reconstruct a self time and time again? Um, I'll read one poem, and then we can play one of those videos. People like me from lands not like this and bodies hosting souls too expansive to stay still have been to dimensions that could help us all. There is a commonly held belief that there is only one reality. This is not true. There are multiple realities operating at every given moment. Think of a moment as a sphere Within each sphere exists an infinite number of points. It is not one or the other, it is all simultaneously. Yes, okay, so the first um, video I'll have you all play. Um, I grew up in Texas for a while and I was a competitive cheerleader which was very intense. Um, and <laughs> I think that was my first um, glimpse of what mania looks like. Um, so I, for this show, um, made a video that kind of reflected on that. And you can hear my poetry in the background. So I think that one's called Bliss.
my story, I'd be pretty happy. Feels good when I drink coffee and run around in circles and feel like I have nothing left but to win. Yeah. Wing, 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 wing. Um, so that's, <laughs> I forgot about the end. <laughs> hello, hello, okay. Yeah, I definitely forgot about the end. Bipolar baddies. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, you know, <laughs> I really did not expect that. Um, what was it, Catherine Zeta-Jones, who else was in there? Amy Winehouse. Charlie Sheen. So Charlie Sheen, I don't know if you guys remember in 2012 when he really brought the word winning into the public sphere. And I think it's the perfect way to talk about um, manic American ex exceptional <laughs> exceptionalism. Um, but yeah, so that to me is manic uh, femininity, which is rampant in Texas. Um, Let's see. So when we were talking, um, we talked about binaries. We talked about the spaces that the mind um, wants to enter, but sometimes can't because of, you know, demands on their being black or white. Um, I'll read another poem. That's short. I think the reason I started checking and counting and predicting is because there's too much to keep track of. Not, oh, like I want things to be black and white, not because I want there to be good and evil, but because I want to be able to hold more things. To be bipolar is to be the ultimate switch you bottom the universe and then you really fucking top it along with everybody ever alive and dead. I learned about the subspace from someone who did not like having sex with me. I was removed in mania. The bliss of mania is being drunk on the infinite. How can one be agnostic after touching the sun and sexing like there was never the idea of sex before. I invented it, I lured and became hot. I'm in a hot underneath and it's probably not COVID. I'm in a hot underneath because I stim so hard it makes me a bottom. I make forts to, I make forts to hide the light. I'll stop there if you wanna show your video. <laughs> I don't know. We you were. T um, <laughs> I'm like change scene. <laughs> <laughs> After that. <laughs> okay. Did, no, I, I mean, it's so you 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 give us this banquet <laughs> that I'm just still like, okay, all right. Uh, that uh, this is wow. Thank you so much for yeah, sharing. No it's problem. incredible. Oh my God. Yeah, no problem. Thank you so much. Um, Really, it's, you know, it, you know, you've really welcomed us into this, you know, you, you just said, you know, like, you know, Ricky's room, it's like, it's an intimacy that I, um, I feel is something that we're constantly navigating, uh, certainly as fluid people, as queer people, um, and yet we're able to identify it, I feel better than people adhere to the binary, um, in that there are more spaces created for varying types of intimacy and that it is an invitation and we're given the option to enter in that intimacy or perhaps take more of a spectator view. And I always personally uh, perceive that as just being an incredibly generous invitation, knowing how certainly for us intimacy has been a place that we have found ourselves, um, we have like self-analyzed that we have uh, gone to regroup with the various selves who we are. And I like, I, it reminds me actually so much and like, you know, you, you've done artist residencies and you know, I, there are some that actually ask you as part of 
the deal of, <laughs> of going into an artist residency to open up your studio space for people to come in oh, and wow. see your work in progress. So I'm like, um, do we really want to know how hot dogs are made? <laughs> um, <laughs> And then, of course, like, you know, like, you know, spoiler alert, ooh, gross. But then we have to make it, like, somehow, um, or as we perceive it, like, palatable for others. So there's, like, you know, we know our spaces so well, and yet there are spaces within those spaces that, you know, are, are like, new ground that we're still exploring. And, um, and in, you know, in in talking of fluidity, there's no start or stop to that. And yet we have to sometimes stop and be like, okay, um, my room is, um, there's an order to it, there's a chaos to it. I feel it's messy, but you know, maybe not to you. Anyway, come in. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so it's a weird negotiation with the self. Um, so again, incredibly grateful that you know, you, that you've shown us, uh, your room and the, you know your work and you know the beautiful insight about you know certainly you know identifying with the sphere and how I feel we've been conditioned so much to accept the start and stop, accept the fact that things do not occur simultaneously, that there's somehow an impossibility to that. Um, we call it coincidence, we call it um, careful planning, but I, I feel that there's so much that can happen in one moment that constantly for us defies the binary and how much of a gift it is to be able to bask in that space mm -hmm. and to find conflict in it and to bask in it. And um, yeah, it's a constant journey, and I feel like you know this is something that we uh, each share in our own way. I certainly put it to practice in my own work. In that, you know, as Tavia mentioned, I'm interested in infecting the space, so constantly messing up the room, <laughs> and not just out of a need to be messy, but rather to show the mess that we're in. And not necessarily as a negative. You know, messy as in like, you know, like, you know, I've been called a hot, sweaty mess in the past, and it's never always been in a negative way. Uh, certainly as a means of seducing, which, you know, sometimes works, sometimes doesn't, depending on the delivery <laughs> and the, the, the source of the, uh, the term. But... Mess to me is something that we can own, just like we can own literally any term for ourselves as a placeholder, you know, as all terms are, as our labels are, like, you know. Um, and mess to me means that it's not, you know, things are not as simple as we're asked consistently to present them. Um, the space we're in, for example, like, you know, we can, you know, yes, you know, Dragons, as you know, as as you know, we were shown earlier, um, but it's dripping with so much history, so much um, invisible labor, for example, that's gone into the construction of this space. Names that we may never know, um, and we may research at one point. Um, but even like delving into like the origin of the trees that this wood was carved from. The German woodworkers, apparently, they were from Germany, from what I understand. Who are they? Where were they from? What did they go through? It's messy. It's so much. And then we're here. We're addressing an infection that exists, and yet we're infecting simultaneously. And that's extremely exciting to me, because we don't have to put things into a slot just to make it palatable for blank. And I feel that we embody that so much. And by we, I mean whoever wants to partake in a semblance or form of that for themselves. And I guess people call it queer for now. <laughs> um, I would love to show a video that I put together uh, as far as trying to show a bit of the work that I've done 
Um, I've been doing this shit for a very long time. And again, I don't mean shit in a negative way as I don't mean messy in a negative way. Shit is beautiful. Um, and I was trying to think of like, you know, going through the 10 plus years I've been doing work, how do I select the pieces that best represent who I am in a short amount of time? And I'm like, you know what? Fuck it, I'm just going to show you what I've done this year and highlights of that even because um, uh, in this fluidity, there's no room for stop and go. It's, um, it's just fluids, delicious fluids. So um, I've, I work in various mediums. Uh, I, I, I work in music, sound, performance, visual. Um, and if there's a commonality, yes, it is about infecting spaces. Um, sharing in a joyful infection and inviting people to infect joyfully or however it is that they want to infect. Um, and certainly we've been uh, shown many times in the past few years what an inf uh, a universal infection looks like and how it's affected our lives physically, emotionally, psychologically. But we've been infecting for far beyond this. And I want to share the idea of a joyful infection. So this video starts uh, with the most current work that I've done and goes backwards. So it starts with this album I released called Excessiva a couple of weeks ago, which is a field recording in which I placed a microphone inside an empty milk jar on the grounds of the McDowell Residency in Peterborough, New Hampshire. And this was on a day that um, the institution decided to put forth an invitation for a Thanksgiving celebration, an institution that very publicly made this huge ordeal about dropping Colony from their name because as the press release stated, it no longer aligned with our values. And yet, the invitations were placed in everyone's slots, all of the residents' slots, for a Thanksgiving feast. The graphic had a cornucopia and everything, so we're... Yes. <laughs> and it was like, and when that was the whole thing, though, like, you know, like, if you don't want to partake, fine, you can just take the food and go back to your cabin and you don't get to partake it with everyone else. People you've been dining with every night during this residency, well, if you have a problem with it, you don't have to participate in it. Just go and hide into your own room. So I was feeling really conflicted, you know, in that I'm also benefiting from the resources that this type of institution is providing. So in trying to navigate that complexity, I went for a walk, found this a uh, dilapidated amphitheater on the grounds of McDowell and sat with my thoughts and just recorded uh, 44 minutes of what the surrounding sounded like passing through an empty milk jar. Hoping that the ancestral energy that I lean into at every waking moment would somehow illuminate me with something or at least allow me to accept joyfully the complexity that I was very um, much struggling with at that moment. So, excessiva is what this video starts with. Going backwards to um, performance infections that I've done with my voice, with my body, in uh, an institution in Valencia, Spain, um, at Human Resources, my home away from home in LA, um, on Fire Island at the Bafo uh, Performance Festival Residency. And going, and there's even a short film that I did called The Angel that celebrates self-pleasure and the empowerment that we can derive as, as queer and fluid and transgender people um, as a means of counterbalancing the, the endless stream of shit that is thrown at us, shit in this uh, situation in a negative. Um, and an excerpt of that, you can't see the full thing because it's literally banned everywhere. Um, and all the way to the beginning of this year, to Canto de Todes, which is a 12-hour composition installation that I debuted at the Red Cat in LA earlier this year that I'm very proud to bring here next year. And anyway, this is a little real, I guess, of 
everything I've just said.
sangue Quando sufras Quando llores También piensa en mí Cuando quieres Quitarme la vida No la quiero Para nada Para nada Me sirve Si Your voice is out of this world. Wow. When, when did you start singing? It's like so, it's so varied. It feels like operatic and also channeling. Oh, wow, well, uh, thank you. I, <clears throat> excuse me, I think, you know, as, as, a, as a kid, just kind of like singing in the shower, and um, I feel like I attributed so much of it to playtime, which sounds very... Even saying playtime makes me sound like I'm five. <laughs> playtime? Um, but I, 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 like now I celebrate playtime. And I feel like so much of, you know, we were talking about both being like, you know, improvisers. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, I feel like, you know, improv is an adult word for playtime. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it's, I feel it's liberating to embrace playtime. Um, and that's, you know, experimentation is another word for playtime. Um, why not, you know, why not call it playtime? You know, when do, you know, what, at what age are we asked to, you know, transition from one word to the next? When it's really just like, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a liberation, it's, you know, it's, it feeds a curiosity. And I feel like, you know, so much like, you know, trying to, you know, find, you know, different things that my voice can do really just comes down to like, Oh, I heard something that you know. Oh, like someone did something like that. Oh, that's. I you know. I wonder if I can try something like that. And never really seeing it from you know appropriating anything, but rather like you know what, how how does it come out of me? And without having to tick a box as far as like well what you know, this is channeling this or that or representing this or that. It's like um, it is really just you know. I was years ago making out with this lovely person um, in this bar in Williamsburg and my, um, we were making out just as I was about to hop on the cab and go you know, to the airport and, um, <clears throat> and then right as we stopped making out, um, he asked me, do you know how to throat sing? And I'm like, 
no. And he's this incredible multi-instrumentalist, and I haven't seen him in years, um, sadly, but um, he's like, well, let me show you. And I'm like, okay, um, I have to catch a cab in like two minutes. He's like, let me show you. So he taught me how to throat sing <laughs> after... Outside of the cab, the cab driver's waiting. I mean, I mean it was actually, we were still in the bar, like, you know, so it was a little, <laughs> a, a little less immediate, I guess. But we were like, really, like, I was like, really like waiting, like, you know, like, keeping an eye on making sure the cab wasn't arriving, but it was very like close to that. So there was like this, this weird thing. I'm like, okay, I'm about to learn throat singing from someone who's been like lubricating my throat with his tongue for the past 20 minutes. Um, He's like, let's put this to work. Exactly. So now, now that we've done that prep work, um, let me show you what else he can do with that throat. Um, and um, so he taught me, and of course, I didn't know, like, I didn't automatically like know how to do it, but. He taught me a technique that I could just practice in the shower. Mm -hmm. um, and I love, you know, I love just, you know, doing playtime in the shower, like, you know, on the toilet, like, you know, the acoustics in the bathroom, like, you know, singers will know. <laughs> it's like, I mean, we know the preciousness of bathroom time. Yeah. <laughs> um, and magic happens there. And, and this was maybe like, oh, like 12 years ago. So I'm like, okay, so every day since then, I'm like, you know, to the delight of my husband listening in the other room, I'm in the shower. <laughs> and, you know, and then finally, like, <laughs> and it's just, and it was like, oh, okay, cute. So, like, he, <laughs> that was a little, like, parting gift. But, I, you know, I, yeah, it really just comes down to that, though, like, you know, playtime and, you know, and. Does he know what he did, this person? <laughs> I don't know if he does. That's I, a whole world. That yeah, I mean, I, I don't think I've actually even talked to him since. And it wasn't like this deliberate, like, parting, you know, gift. But rather, like, I don't know. Like, some people just remain in your life for, you know, for 10 minutes, 20 minutes, you know, for several weeks, years. And someone I, you know, I think about, um, I you know, but never, you know, Never really thought to seek out, really. So it just one of those things where I'm like, okay, grateful that you know we had a good time and taught me really one of the fundamentals of what I do. Yeah, vocally. it's amazing. Um, so yeah, you just you never know when you meet people yeah. what they're gonna what what you're gonna learn. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I feel like I was thinking about um, what makes uh, what has made my voice shift over the years. Um, I think, you know, I showed you all the manic cheerleader stuff, so that set up my voice um, in a really intense way. Um, I saw a cousin maybe a year ago, and she, she was like, your voice, is, it's lower. You used to be so high-pitched. Like, imagine the voice that matches that person you just saw doing, <laughs> um, you know these tricks, but um, yeah, I feel like the voice really tells a story that um, sometimes you're not even ready to tell for yourself. Um, I think my singing really kind of extricated a lot of toxins from me. Um, I didn't plan on being a musician. I basically bought a loop pedal and looped for like six months in my in my apartment and um, yeah you you set you create a whole world and then you start having these languages um, and someone gives you a parting gift that gets gets um, to be a part of that language but the voice really carries a lot yeah Thank you. can I ask you like when did, when did you start singing? Um, you know, I, I always sang jazz, and um, I actually would forget everything. You know, I was in a jazz band, but I would get on stage and not be able to remember anything, and so the band would just be floating, and I would just turn it into this vibey situation that no one really asked for. <laughs> so so I, I stopped being in bands for that reason. <laughs> um, and so I think because of the way my brain works, I became an improviser. Um, you know, I feel like it's, 
I guess we were talking on Zoom about um, sometimes uh, holding on to a linearity of time or um, a structure of gender. I was also talking to you about like aging and how sometimes it just feels like with all of those things, gravity just does its work and um, the things that you're trying to uphold to be legible just fall. Um, so I think all of that to say, the jazz band, I couldn't hold it up, so <laughs> I became an improviser. Um, and I think um, at congealing or coming to some sort of um, consolidation takes time. Now the music that I make, it's more structured. I think that's because of the quiet time in COVID when I was able to not have the constant input of New York create even more fractures. Um, I spent a lot of time in LA and I can see the difference in the way that um, my mind was able to finish sentences and um, you know make endings. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've, I've sang since I was very young. For some reason, I was really into adult contemporary music as a child. <laughs> I've always felt divorced since I was like 10. So <laughs> I was singing Celine Dion and um, Tony Braxton because I had had my heart broken <laughs> by something or somebody. Um, but yeah, you know... Um, I'm, tr I'm trying to, I guess, this is called The World is Memory. That's what we're doing here. Yeah, so The World is Memory. Memory, it's almost like um, in, I guess it was 2014, I did this thing where I sang the same song over and over for a year. I didn't know why I did that, but I think it was me trying to commit something to memory to prove it to myself. Um, and I think that repetition kind of um, creates grooves where your, your mind can finally hold on to things. And sometimes I think that the identities we take on are just grooves that have been created since we were born, just people paving and paving and paving until it's a part of your mind, your body. Um, and so I, I guess sometimes it's like survival. Deciding how you're going to survive is, am I going to allow these grooves to be or am I going to try and make my own? Am I gonna try and fill it up and pave it over? Yes, so that's, that's how I started singing. Wow. <laughs> yeah. I love that, I love that. And I, I love how there's, um, there's really like an embracing of you know of of the fluidity uh, you know just as far as uh, something you know not even like as strong but like even stronger than the constructs of jazz for example like you know and and like free jazz like you know is is pitched to us as you know a you know a, a more liberated form of jazz but even still there are very strict parameters around that mm -hmm. And certainly compared to like, you know, what you were describing, like just, you know, going places and taking your voice places. And it sounds almost like you were letting yourself be taken to places by your voice in a way. Do you see like a kind of like a separation of like the voice as like a different existence or? Well, I mean, during the time that I was making these videos, I had a lot of characters. <laughs> Sorry, I just saw something like that. Um, I had a lot of characters. There was that manic cheerleader. There was someone named Vacation Boy who would go to Flatbush and have a whole time and pretend that it was the Caribbean. Um, <laughs> there was a cowboy situation. Um, so, whoa, what was the question? <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> I don't know. I love the answer so much. <laughs> Why the question? What was the Why question? Why the question? 
<laughs> no, but really. <laughs> no, I think. Well, the, the well, I, interestingly, you were. Oh, you, transportation, transport. Yeah, transporting. Yeah. Yes, the voice definitely, <laughs> definitely trans. Yeah, transports me to Flatbush, aka the Caribbean. Um, yeah, I mean, I found parts of myself through my voice in ways I would have never imagined. Um, sometimes too far. Sometimes I'm like, we're not doing that one again. <laughs> Which is why, why I'm making pop now, but. <laughs> I, 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 oh, I love that. That really resonates because that's how we, I, I feel that's how we appreciate like, you know, coming back to like our rooms. Mm -hmm. Is like, you know, how far can we actually go away from our rooms? And, you know, in doing so, how, you know, how do we, better understand our rooms ourselves within that space that we create for ourselves and um <clears throat> in the in, in the idea of, like the world is memory and like the world like traveling mm -hmm. traveling the world um and addressing memory like i feel that there's <clears throat> excuse me sorry um i feel that um in you know in in the idea of memory like you know there's a collecting of of personalities, mm -hmm. of people that we welcome into our being, into our identities, and 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 how they are, you know, constantly dancing with each other, arguing with each other, um, and just you know, part of the fluidity that we just throw ourselves into. Um, and I feel memory really, like you know, is a big part of that. And I think in the realm of memory, there's trauma mm -hmm. that we carry with us as well, and. And that also informs our voices as to where it is that they will take us. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, there's also, I don't know where, you know, you say facts and then you don't have any evidence of anything, but I'm just going to say it. Some, something I've, I've heard is that sometimes your voice can get stuck in a moment that you've had intense trauma. And that to me is a really big depiction of what it can mean for your voice to be suspended in time because of what happened or what it had to um, respond to. Yeah. Oh, that's, uh, I, I, I feel that completely. Mm -hmm. The idea, yeah, the idea of being stuck is, um, I feel that can even be like a perception in that like, you know, as everything around us is in constant flux and even like within our own bodies there you know the process of aging is a process of movement the idea of feeling stuck though like i mean i've felt it mm -hmm. and yet it is almost like taking a back seat to the ongoing forward moving forward seeming moving you know uh fluidity of uh of time and um, and what that does to you know either keep us feeling stuck more or or pull us out of that and um, and I'm like I'm so fascinated by that because I feel like that's something that is so individual too and in how we address that and how we <clears throat> how we feel that and I love the idea that as fluid people as queer people we can um, we can embody that in our own way and create spaces for ourselves and then welcome others into those spaces so they can practice that for themselves and, you know, bring their rooms to a larger room, for example. Like, I feel like we're, we each bring, we each brought our own rooms tonight in a way and I don't know, I, <clears throat> I'm a feeling person, like I feel that and, um, and you know, grateful for it, and definitely welcome it. So, um, rooms. I have a question that I wanted to ask. What was the song? It it was kind of. It had a beat. It was kind of like reggaeton. It was a banger. I don't know what yes. else to say. What was yes. that? Yes. <laughs> so that was. Um, that was uh, a collaboration with my dear Sibi, Rocco Cordova, whom I did this residency with at Bafo on Fire Island, what seems like yesterday, but it was two months ago, so it is yesterday. Um, and we did our reggaeton song together, and it's called Centella Ramera Se Va Con Cualquiera, 
which is um, which is Spanish for lightning whore goes with whomever they want. Oh shit. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and it, this was actually all, you know, as, as you know, as I feel like you and I really connected through a Zoom conversation. Rocco, who lives in Oakland and I live in LA, we, you know, we had a Zoom like a few weeks before the residency to figure out a title for something that we hadn't even created, but we needed a title. Uh, so, um, so we just went back and forth, and the idea of you know just exploring nature and like lightning oh lightning is you know is is a, you know a rebellious uh very you know vivid uh manifestation of nature mm -hmm. and uh flashy and really appears whenever they want and you know goes with whomever they i'm like oh like what if like lightning is you know, in a celebratory, empowering way, a whore. <laughs> and so, like, you know, so we were also, like, trying to rhyme things in Spanish. So, like, centella ramera se va con cualquiera. It just happened. We're like, oh, that's it right there. <laughs> and so then we built this song around the idea that, like, you know, that nature is this just, you know, em, you know empowered, self-pleasuring, um, but also wrathful, mm -hmm. you know, creature being you know existence and um and we you know and Rocco who is from Puerto Rico has uh, much more experience with reggaeton than I do like I've only come into reggaeton in the past couple of years you're um, a natural it sounded oh like. thank yeah. you <laughs> yeah. it's yeah I mean again it was just it's it was playtime and that's you know that's what we did and like you know I you know I I love reggaeton now, um, and you know, and and Rocco really like helped you know, like ease me into actually singing reggaeton, and like they're, I mean, they're so brilliant, they're so amazing, and um, we we wanted to do something that was yes, like very celebratory, but also like you know, we like keeping things dark, and <laughs> um, and certainly, uh, certainly, in you know, in in what you know is a very. Um, intense environment of Fire Island being so incredibly cis, gay, mm -hmm. white, male. Um, you know how you know how do we just get even darker? Um, yeah. and it's almost patriotic. Yes, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Why, no, yeah. I mean, it's I I, don't, I typically decry all patriotism, but yeah. I no, think I'm that point, oh, I'm saying the the white gay <laughs> oh, situation. Oh my god, it, it feels it, patriotic. It really is. Yeah, you know, it's just oh, like stepping into yet another piece of like so such a vivid manifestation of stolen land and stolen everything yeah. and. Um, and then going in and reclaiming something, but not in, you know, in a settler colonizing way, but rather like, you know, again, shining a light on what's already, what's always been there and channeling that. And I feel like that's, uh, that was like an example of like, you know, entering any space. And I feel certainly a space like this, like any space, knowing that these spaces weren't built for us. I think maybe the exception of Fire Island was. <laughs> <laughs> in that you know it's it was taken over by you know by you know by a colonizer mentality um and that is something like when we're talking about like you know like an a natural setting like you know to go to the origins of that and to channel that and you know and to shine a light on that and rather than trying to reclaim a structure um it was to really just be there um in a place of gratitude for being there and mm -hmm. Uh, you know, and as I love doing, typically leaning into ancestral energy. Mm -hmm. Always. Yes. I, I, I got a sign to wrap it up. Okay. But <laughs> that was beautiful. Thank you. Oh, thank you I so want much. that track. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. We're supposed to record it at some point, but um, I want that track that you did. That's incredible. Like, manage, yeah. <laughs> love, the, love, manage. The really bliss. Really. Yes, yeah, the bliss. Oh, the my bliss. God. Yes, please. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's extraordinary. Thank you. Extraordinary. <laughs> So I think I'm I'm supposed to do some singing. Um, yeah, I'll do that. So I'm gonna I think I'm gonna sing a few of the. Um, I've been trying to figure out what to call them. Maybe linear songs, songs that repeat for once. I did it. Really felt like a an accomplishment to get that to happen. 
While this is um, happening, maybe you can play the, I think it's the Underwater Now video. Um, I read the poem, but you can see the visual now. especially when they seem contradictory. This essential frustration, the pain we feel when we're asked to hold multiple truths at once, is the source of much suffering from micro family 
relationships to macro countries and their politics. We feel betrayed by our minds when we secretly discover that our righteously held beliefs are true as much as any other's righteously held beliefs are true, or rather real. This does not account for morality. I don't know what the fuck to do about morality. All I know is that it all fucking hurts.